Hello everyone, welcome back to Southern Union EMS's Toxicology Lecture, Part 5. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about carbon monoxide, chlorine gas, cyanide, and caustic material and their effects on the body in treatment. Carbon monoxide is one of the most common fatal poisonings. It is a tasteless, odorless gas that people do not realize that they are being exposed to. Often found with the use of gas-powered heaters in confined spaces, running a vehicle in a closed garage, and also associated with house fires. Again, it is colorless, odorless, and tasteless, so you don't have any idea that it's uh, affecting you. The issue with carbon monoxide is that it displaces oxygen, which prevents oxygen to the tissues. So this causes cellular asphyxiation or suffocation at the cellular level. Any increase in the body's metabolic or oxygen demands will increase the severity of the poisoning. These will include tachycardia, fever, or exertion. So you increase the oxygen demand, you're just going to increase condition here. CO displaces oxygen from the hemoglobin molecule in the red blood cells because it, of its greater affinity for binding to hemoglobin. Even relatively small concentrations of car, uh, CO in the atmosphere can convert a single proportion of hemoglobin into carboxyhemoglobin or hemoglobin combined with carbon monoxide, making it ineffective as a oxygen carrier. CO poisoning can be difficult to diagnose in the field. Consider the patient's environment. Was there adequate ventilation? Was a source of combustion present, such as gasoline engines? The signs and symptoms of CO poisoning are highly variable and vague, often resembling early onset of the flu, for example, headache, nausea, and vomiting. With acute CO poisoning, the patient may experience headache, fatigue, nausea, tachypnea, tachycardia, and confusion. The cherry red color that can be seen in the light-skinned people is a late sign of CO poisoning that is seen in the morgue. Given the difficulty in detection, many EMS organizations have placed CO detectors on portable equipment carried into emergency scenes to alert the crew of hazards. When trying to assess your patient, carbon monoxide binding to the hemoglobin will give you false positives on the uh, SpO2. Recent developments in technology have given paramedics the ability to perform non-invasive identification of CO poisoning, or SPCO, in the field. This is similar to pulse oximetry, which helps address the problem as I just mentioned. Management for the carbon monoxide patient. Is in the field is aimed at providing the highest concentration of oxygen available to attempt to displace the CO molecules. So in this case, you would give lots and lots of high flow oxygen. For patients with mild symptoms such as headache, nausea, and flu-like symptoms, the elimination half-life of uh, carboxyhemoglobin is roughly four hours. By comparison, if the patient is breathing 100% oxygen, then the half time can be reduced to about one and a half hours. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy at two and a half atmospheres of pressure can further reduce the elimination time to 15 to 20 minutes. Chlorine gas. Chlorine compounds are commonly used in the home and in the occupational settings. Household ingestions can occur if chlorine-containing solutions are kept in unlabeled containers. Acute exposures are often caused by faulty industrial valves or pumps that dump large amounts of gas into the environment, possibly exposing many people. Leakage from an industrial storage tank, truck, or rail car can result in mass casualty incidents. Minor exposure may include burning in the eyes, nose, throat, and a slight cough, whereas severe exposure may include cyanosis, shock, and even seizures. 
Chlorine gas is extremely irritating to all mucous membranes. When it comes in contact with the moisture on those surfaces, it can form hydrochloric acid and other substances that are damaging to the human tissue. Even with a minor exposure, the patient may have the uh, symptoms mentioned earlier. More intense exposure causes chest tightness, choking, paroxysmal cough, headache, nausea, vomiting, and diffuse wheezing. Patients with more severe exposures may also develop what I mentioned, cyanosis, pulmonary edema, shock, seizures, and loss of consciousness. Again, primary goal for assessment and management is going to be get the patient out of that situation, but do not expose yourself to that situation. After you, after you have moved the patients to a safe environment, quickly triage the patients. Deliver high concentration of humidified oxygen to help with the irritation of mucous membranes. With these patients, especially in the form of a mass casualty situation, uh, patients with respiratory distress are a priority. The use of continuous positive airway pressure or bi-level positive airway pressure may benefit these patients. An administration of approximately 4% nebulized sodium bicarbonate solution or a 2 milliliter 8.4% sodium bicarbonate and a 2 milliliter sterile water may be ordered in confirmed symptomatic chlorine exposures and can provide symptomatic relief. Also consider RSI if the patient is uh, to the point where they can no longer concentrate or compensate. Cyanide. Cyanide is rarely seen in the field, but it is one of the most rapid acting and deadly poisons. It is considered a mitochondrial toxin that does its damage by combining with a crucial cellular enzyme, cytochrome oxidase, which in turn blocks the utilization of oxygen at the cellular level. Cellular hypoxia can rapidly develop throughout the body, causing cardiovascular collapse and death. Its gaseous form, which is hydrogen cyanide, is often colorless with occasional reports of a bitter almond scent. Cyanide may also be found in chemicals used in manufacturing of plastic paper and textiles, the process of electroplating, and some plants and seeds, such as a peach pit. Cyanide poisoning has been used in a method of execution, genocide, and suicide. It is very deadly. When it comes with when it combines with cytochrome oxidase, this leads to cellular suffocation, death within seconds if inhaled, and death within minutes to possibly an hour or two if ingested. Some of your common signs and symptoms headache, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, vertigo, weakness, and dyspnea. Patients who have either inhaled or ingested cyanide may have the most dramatic appearances. Management, there's a couple of management options for cyanide treatment. Should be treated as uh, quickly as possible. 100% oxygen uh, via normal breathing mask or bag mask vent assisted ventilation. The goal is to displace cyanide from cytochrome oxidase, introducing another chemical to bind to it to prevent cellular suffocation. An amyl nitrite kit, if it's available, amyl nitrite is a antidote for cyanide. If the kit's not available, you can break amyl nitrite into a gauze pad. Hold the gauze soaked in amyl nitrite over the patient's nose. While you administer the amyl nitrite, your partner should establish vascular access. Anticipate hypotension and keep the patient supine with the legs elevated. If the systolic blood pressure falls below 80 millimeters of mercury, consult medical control about whether to administer an IV vasopressor. Monitor the ECG. Notify the receiving hospital of the probable diagnosis so that staff can begin a preparation of sodium thiosulfate. Transport without delay to the appropriate facility. Sodium nitrite is another medication to consider for cyanide poisoning. Um, one of the issues is that with both amyl nitrite and sodium nitrite, um, you may structure of the 
hemoglobin turn into methemoglobinemia, and in that case, you would have to administer methylene blue. Hydroxocobalamin is another kit that may be um, used. Hydroxocobalamin is a member of the vitamin B12 family. Consider this, if available, for patients who are hypotensive, have altered mental status, or in cardiac arrest after being removed from a house fire. It is a safe alternative or adjunct to the traditional treatment of cyanide poisoning. Patients may experience side effects of redness of the skin, eyes, and urine, and itching. So methylene blue is an antidote used to treat the meth methemoglobinemia. Methemoglobinemia is an alteration of hemoglobin induced by amyl nitrite and sodium nitrite. This is typically not given in the field. Should be avoided in mild cases of sign poisoning as well. Caustics are going to be considered strong acids and strong alkalis. Strong acids have a pH of less than 2.0 and a strong alkali. Alkali is considered with a pH of greater than 12.0. These are commonly used in industry, agriculture, and the home settings. Uh, some common examples of your strong acids include hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid. Uh, examples of strong alkalis include lye, sodium hypochlorite, or sodium carbonate, ammonia, So the issue with your caustics is that they can cause chemical injury to the tissues and it all depends on how it was uh, taken or how the patient was exposed. Alkalis cause uh, an issue called liquefaction necrosis or a breakdown of tissue to pus and the lid contents of the involved cells. Acids cause coagulation necrosis. Dilution, dilution or neutralization to slow or stop the damage process is going to be key here. Some signs and symptoms you may see drooling, burns, difficulty clean, swallowing, hypoperfusion, or shock. If it suggests that the lid puts the mouth and begins to burn immediately all the people in the membranes, the patient may simultaneously remove the bone from the head with all the burns and mouth on the face and head. Drip onto the chest, and you may see burns on the chest as well. For caustic ingestion, dilute in milk or water within minutes of exposure, establish vascular access and immediate transport if indicated. For dermal exposure, dilute and flush away the substance ASAP. For eye exposure, place a prong section of a nasal cannula on the bridge of the patient's nose and provide continuous irrigation. Do not give any neutralizing substances in the field. Do not induce vomiting. Do not perform gastric lavage. And do not give activated charcoal. So this concludes part five of the Toxicology Lecture Series. Thank you for listening. If you need me for anything, nickray at suscc.edu.